I stood in front of this young woman, a child, really, so young to be part of God's plan. She was troubled, and in her thoughts, she wondered what I was doing there. Do not be afraid, Mary, I said. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. She waited only slightly before asking how this could be. For nothing is impossible with God, I told her. Now without waiting, she responded, may it be to me as you have said. I left her immediately and knew that she would be waiting for this promised child. Let there be light. Let the light shine in the darkness. The call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 80. We will be reading verses 1 to 7 and 17 to 19. Please join me in the call to worship. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God, make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. O Lord God Almighty, how long will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us a source of contention to our neighbors, and our enemies mock us. Restore us, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. Peace, the time is near of the crowning of the year. Make your house fair as you are able. Trim the hearth and set the table. People look east and look sing east today. today. Love, the guest is on the way. Burrows be glad, the earth is bare. One more seed is planted there. Give up your strength and see to nourish that in course the flower may flourish. People look east and sing today. Love the roses on the way. Stars keep the watch when night is dim. One more light the bowl shall brim, shining beyond the frosty weather, bright as the sun and moon together. People look east and sing today, love the star is on the way. Angels announce with shouts of mirth, him who brings 
brings new life to earth. Set every peak and valley humming with the word, the Lord is coming. People look east and sing today, love the Lord is on the way. Our good and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you today with praise and with thanksgiving as we begin a new Advent season. We remember that this time is a time in which we recall your breaking into history to save your people from their sins. We pray, Lord, that as we begin this new season, that we would consecrate it to you. Lord, that we would make time to worship you to sit with you quietly, to confess those things that we need to confess before you, and to be open to all that you would teach us. Lord, as we look at the whole theme of waiting, I pray that you would teach us that our waiting is waiting for something that is true and will really come. Give us, Lord, a heart to see the way in which you show up every day. Be with Abram today as he brings us your word. Bless him, Lord. Empower him by your spirit. And by your spirit, enliven our hearts to hear that which you would teach us. Pray that you would be with Abram and with his family. Keep them strong and healthy. We thank you for them. We bless your name, Lord. We bless your name that you did not count staying in heaven is something that you need to do, but you broke through into history and came into our life to pursue us. Lord, help us to pursue you. We thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. souls in stillness wait for you O Lord our souls in stillness wait truly our hope is in you truly our hope is in you O Lord of life Hope, your radiance shines on all who look to you in the dark. Emmanuel, come, come light our hearts. O Lord of life, our only hope, your radiance shines on all who look to you in the dark. Emmanuel, come. Come light our hearts For you, O Lord, our souls in stillness wait For you, O Lord, our souls in stillness wait Truly our hope is in you Truly our hope is in you Joy above all other loves in you we find more than enough. We come as we are, oh heal and restore, come light our hearts. Oh joy above all other loves in you we find more than enough. We come as we are, oh, heal and restore, come light our hearts. For you, O oh Lord, our souls in stillness wait. For you, O oh Lord, our souls in stillness wait. Truly our hope is in you, truly 
I hope is in you. Truly, I hope is in you. Truly, I hope is in you. Truly, I hope is in you. Our first reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, 
but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down, and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against your ways, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O oh Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. O oh, look upon us, we pray, for we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. St. Anselm of Canterbury was a brilliant philosopher and theologian who lived from 1033 to 1109. Anselm described his approach to philosophy and theology as faith-seeking understanding. Faith-seeking understanding. For Anselm, belief came first, but a believer grows in that faith and even tests that faith through reason faith seeking understanding. Well, one commentary I read this week described our reading, Isaiah 64, as pain seeking understanding. Pain seeking understanding. Pain comes first and often lingers even as we struggle to understand it. But we want to understand pain, so in our pain we seek understanding. Don't you think pain seeking understanding describes what so many prayers in the year 2020 have been? Prayers in our country, in our families, in our congregation, in all of these places, our pain drives us to pray. Speaking of prayer and pain, I have been deeply missing our Sunday morning sanctuary prayer time together. We do have Zoom prayer time every Friday morning at 7.30 a.m. Anyone can always come to, and that's great, but it's not the same as all being together under one roof in one sanctuary, sharing with each other our joys and concerns, and knowing that right then and there, a brother or sister in Christ is going to pray for you. It's powerful, and it's always been one of my favorite parts of our worshiping life together. I miss that immensely. And I think it's hurt us to not get to have that space and time together in that particular way. 
Isaiah has something to say to us about the pain of not worshiping together. Before the lectionary reading, he had said the prior chapter, now our adversaries have trampled down your sanctuary. And just after today's verses, Isaiah will go on in chapter 64, verse 10, your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation, our holy and beautiful house where our ancestors praised you has been burned by fire and all our pleasant places have become ruins. I've been in our sanctuary very recently, and I can assure you it's neither burned down nor turned to ruins, but it is most definitely empty. It has become, to use Isaiah's language, a sort of wilderness. Our holy and beautiful house where we have had sharing and prayers of the faith community for so many years That space sits empty, largely unused, and that hurts. So what kind of understanding can this pain hope to find? I get the sense that even Isaiah didn't know what to do with his pain when he started this prayer in chapter 64 of his book. He just tried to pray his way back to God. And however hard everything might be right now, However interminable our waiting might feel, like Isaiah, we can at least pray. We can at least open our lips and speak. We can at least say, God is with me right here and sit in God's presence. Even if we don't know how to speak, Isaiah shows us a way. The prophet's prayer starts with a groan. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. In his pain, in his people's desolation, Isaiah cries out to God, begging God, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies. Show them who you are, God, and cause the nations to quake before you. There's a gripping scene in the movie The Truman Show. If you haven't seen it, there are spoilers ahead. Jim Carrey is Truman Burbank, who only as an adult realizes that his entire life has been staged and it's being filmed for a wildly popular reality TV show, The Truman Show. Everyone around him is an actor on this set and is in on it. When he starts to suspect something is not right, he confronts his wife Meryl, played by Laura Linney, who feels compelled to keep up appearances. Truman says to her, you're part of this, aren't you? She tries to fend him off with a slicing, dicing, peeling implement from her kitchen, from their kitchen. And and he grabs her and takes the would-be weapon away from her and he wraps his arm around her neck and she looks into a hidden camera and yells to the off-screen producers, ah, do something. This is Isaiah's prayer in verses 1 and 2. God, do something. God, do something. If only you would intervene. But the prayer implies you're not doing something right now, God. Or if you are, I don't see it. Things are not as they should be. So please, God, do something. Because this prayer in Isaiah 64 is such a good model, and because we can relate to at least some of Isaiah's pain, and to give us a chance to pray together virtually, I'm going to give us a little bit of time right now to pray our own God do something prayer. So on the screen, you'll see Isaiah 64, one through two as a sort of guide, or you can pray on your own. Uh, a more specific, personal version of God do something.
after Isaiah cries out for God to do something, he brings to mind times when God did, in fact, do something. And get this, in verse 1, Isaiah prayed, Come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. And now in verse 3, he prays, For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down, and the mountains trembled before you. In other words, God, the very thing that I'm asking you to do right now, you've done it before. The specific plea that I'm making, not a problem for you. I've seen it. I've seen you do it. You can make these mountains tremble because I've experienced that. You did awesome things that we did not expect. And in verse 4, God acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Isaiah remembers what God has done in the past for him and for his people. When we pray, our petitions for the future are grounded in the past. Our prayers for the future are grounded in events of the past. Whatever we ask God to do today or tomorrow, we would do well to remember how God did it yesterday. And we believe God can do it again. I invite you now to take some more time in prayer, calling to mind a time or times in the past when God did awesome things that you did not expect. So far, Isaiah has asked God to do something. He's remembered the past when God has done something. And now, starting in the second part of verse 5, he gets more personal, more introspective. There's something about calling to mind God's goodness and intervention that has brought Isaiah to his knees. He's humbled. He has said in verse 5, You come to the help of those who gladly do right who remember your ways. And then he goes on, but when we continue to sin against your ways, you were angry. How then can we be saved? God came down. God acted on Isaiah's behalf. God came to the help of his people who were gladly doing right and remembering his ways. And then they forgot. They forgot. They kept on sinning against God's ways, making God angry. Passages about God's anger might not be the most well-worn pages in our Bibles. This may deserve deeper reflection, another sermon or two, but for now, I can simply recommend a book that I read earlier this year called 
But what about God's wrath? The compelling love story of divine anger by Kevin Kinghorn. That subtitle drew me right in, the compelling love story of divine anger. Kinghorn makes the point that God's anger does not stand in contrast to God's love, but that God's anger is perfect and, in fact, is an expression of God's perfect love. For Kinghorn, God's wrath is simply God pressing the truth on us. And as Scott Sunquist, the president of Gordon-Conwell, says, it is not loving to hide the truth. And the truth is, we're not healthy. We need to be restored, even revived. So God, even in his anger, is restoring us and reviving us. He's pressing the truth on us, seeking to free us from the deception that we too often tolerate or wink at and that causes us great harm. Isaiah prays, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. Just as Isaiah remembers what God has done in the past, he remembers how all of us have failed to call on God's name, have not strived to lay hold of God. And so God, in his loving anger, has given over his people to the consequences of their sins. Of course, the goal is restoration, returning to a right relationship with the Lord. This penitential prayer, these verses 6 and 7 it's perfect for Advent. But Jesus will come and speak decisively into this moment of Isaiah's prayer. Paul will write in Romans, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How then can we be saved? Isaiah prays. Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Isaiah prays, But when we continue to sin against your ways, you were angry. I invite you now to some more moments of prayer where we can all call to mind and confess ways that we have sinned against God and God's ways. The Bible says that we have forgiveness of sins through Jesus, that if we confess our sins, 
He who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So receive that promise as you have just confessed to God. Having started his prayer with do something, having remembered what God has done, having acknowledged his and his people's sinfulness to God, Isaiah cries out once more, verse 8, Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look upon us, we pray, for we are all your people. God, he prays, remember, we are your people. Do not remember our sins. Shape us as clay, O Lord. Do not let your anger persist. Let your anger be just enough and not a moment more to lead us back to you. And then withdraw it, O God. Isaiah's prayer continues, but the first Advent lection ends here, with acknowledgement that God is God and we are not. God is Father, Potter, Creator. No matter how ruined Isaiah's sanctuary, he and all his people still belong to God. No matter how empty and unattended our own sanctuary is right now, we all still belong to God. We are the work of God's hands, and God who created us sustains us each day. Let me leave you now with another moment of silence to offer a closing prayer of your own to God.
And now receive the benediction. Go now and walk in the light of the Lord. Stay alert, for the Lord is near. Put on the armor of light and live openly and honorably. Pray for peace for all God's people. And may God clothe you in the light of Christ. May Christ Jesus teach you his ways. And may the Holy Spirit keep you alert and prepared for the coming day of the Lord. Amen.